it's important to recognize that although we're one of the the early adopters and one of the first groups in this space, there's an undeniable change happening and there's a lot of people who are jumping into this space now. And uh, technology has caught up with dreams. We're excited for everybody. I think um, it's a little, a little unique in that like we focus a lot. Um, there's a lot of enterprise tech companies in Utah and that's really fueling like a lot of our growth, but there's also some exciting emerging tech companies that you may have heard of and you may not have. John, tell us a little bit about Electrofly. All right, um, at Electrofly, we're an aviation startup. Our idea is to build uh, personal flying machines. So you can think of like uh, the Jetsons or Star Wars speeder bikes, something like that. And uh, it looks kind of like a motorcycle with wings and propellers and a jet engine. Our primary goal is to increase payload and range for multi-rotor aircraft. A lot of people have tried to build bigger drones and they take existing technology and make it bigger. And there's really no innovation that allows that to fly longer or carry more loads. And so that's, that's our primary goal and objective. And uh, we have uh, international PCT patent application that, that we've been working on. The joy I get from flying fulfills me. Teal is at the smaller end of the spectrum. Uh, I started Teal about four and a half years ago now. All of the drones that you can buy today uh, are meant to take photos and videos, and they are great at that. Um, and there's a lot of companies competing in, in the consumer drone space today that, that do that. But I had the idea that drones can be more than just flying cameras, and drones can be these incredible, positive things in our lives that have the potential to be way more than that. So to date, we've raised just over $20 million in venture capital. Uh, like I mentioned, started Teal about four and a half years ago now while I was a senior in high school. Um, and launched, uh, launched a couple products into the consumer space and now focusing more on enterprise and defense with some really exciting opportunities. Take us along that, like, that journey, how you got from being a hobbyist sort of to a CEO of a tech startup. And over the years, as I was growing up, I just always wanted to explore different ways to fly and, and different ways to experience flight. Uh, in 2012, got pretty good at flying, uh, applied to be a test pilot for a drone manufacturer that accepted me in, um, and started learning more about hardware and software and how everything works. Uh, and then between 2012 and 2014, I just dove into trying to build some of my own technologies and platforms. So I built this large multi-rotor that could carry up to about 20 pounds and, and fly for about two hours. I uh, built something called a, a thrust vectoring multi-rotor that could fly just over 100 miles an hour. And then I had the idea for Teal and built this small 3D printed prototype powered by an onboard computing platform. I could fly it with an app through my smartphone. Uh, and that, that was around 2015 when I had the idea for Teal. Raised a, a pre-seed round of funding with an angel investor at the beginning of 2015 as things were getting formally started. By the end of 2015, we raised our first seed round of funding. And in 2016, started building the team. We hired our COO, uh, his name's Billy. He wasn't able to be here today. Uh, but th that's when I was in, uh, that was when I was in uh, my 12th grade in, in high school. Um, still had braces, no driver's license. Billy had to pick me up from school. We went to Pelion's office to, to work. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was great. So how do you go from being you know, like a senior in high school to like also at the same time managing like this tech startup and like saying, oh yeah, we're going to do this. But junior year when I had the idea for Teal, I started working with, with some of the, the folks at, at my school and they, uh, they actually let me spend some of my time during the day working on the company, uh, giving me some time to do that. And so that helped a ton through junior and, and senior year. Um, and then it was just, you know, having to hunker down a little bit and, and make things work. I don't regret how, how things have gone and, and where we are today. There's a ton of opportunity ahead and, and absolutely love what I do. Um, but I did have to give up sort of the traditional high school, college experience, didn't go to college. And John, you took a little different route. You waited a little longer than uh, George. Yeah. You weren't a high school I, senior. I'm, but... I'm jealous of George, yeah. so. Yes. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about how you went, uh, how you started Electrofly. I think that uh, flying is one of those things that you're generally born with, you know, like uh, you, you either love it or you don't, maybe, and, and uh, 
I, I, uh, I don't remember a time where I didn't want to fly. It was just always the thing that I wanted to do. And uh, I think I've always had this fascination with the minimum feature set to make a person fly. So like something that you put on rather than get into really was, it was kind of the fascination and the goal. We're actually a lot newer company at Electrofly. We've been around for less than a year publicly. We live in such an exciting time where you can do whatever you want. Uh, your, your, your imagination and regulation, unfortunately, is, is, are your limits. And you're a pilot, right? Yeah, yeah, so I, I'm currently an airline pilot. So how do you go from saying, okay, I'm gonna fly this big plane to jump on something with rotors? <laughs> Back in the day that George was talking about, if you wanted a multi-rotor aircraft, you had to build one. And I used to say back then, I'd say, you know, like in five years, it doesn't matter if you care about aviation or not. These things are going to be a part of your everyday life. Yeah, it's been interesting to see how, how popular drones have become. I would say consumer drones reached their, their hype in 2016, maybe. Uh, and then we kind of went into the trough of disillusionment a little bit. And then we're gradually climbing out of that. Um, there are some, some things technology-wise in the consumer space that are holding drones back from becoming ubiquitous and actually part of, of everyday life. And so that was one of the, the purposes of Teal was to accelerate the adoption of drones and make them just a seamless part of everyday life. It's just awesome to see where, where the market's going, where the technology's going. And like you say, like anything is possible today and it's the coolest thing. Um, it's fun to live in the future. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Tell us a little bit about some of your challenges. Uh, we'll ask both of you the challenges because, I mean, it's, it's, this isn't easy. You know, you're dealing with hardware and software and making things get off the ground and not crash. Um, tell us a little bit about some of the challenges you guys have had t uh, with Teal. Things got started, started pretty quickly. I'd say our biggest challenge, like any startup, is not getting off the ground but staying off the ground. Obviously, you need to have a vision and a passion and, and purpose for what you're doing. And I think what helped me was, was always staying optimistic and grateful. My job is to hire good people and not run out of money. And I thought that would be easy. It was not easy. <laughs> so there were some unique challenges with hardware. I think the bigger challenge, which is more common across every type of startup, is people. People can be the most amazing thing in the world and, and people can also be the end of your world. At Electrofly, you know, we're such a new company that uh, our biggest challenge is really balancing time with resources and manpower and uh, money um, so you know we're we're a bootstrapped group and we're always you know trying to balance everything anything that like uh, failures that stand out like maybe it made you guys better the biggest failure is being afraid of failure because nobody does anything when they're afraid of failure and so I think that uh, uh, as a startup you know you you watch every dollar and you watch everything but at some point you have to be like, forget about that, you know, like spend the money, do the job, and then worry about it. I think it's, it's more dangerous to be afraid of failure than the actual failure. We shipped our first product in 2017. We called it the Teal Sport. It was a, a racing drone that was based off of the architecture of our flagship drone that we we're about to release the year after. Uh, and that was our first go at releasing a product into the consumer market, like, going from design to production to supporting it out in the field. Um, the first small batch of Teal Sports that we're testing in a really hard crash, if, uh, uh, if you crash at just the right angle and snap apart internally, uh, you could still fly, but then it would catch on fire. So we had a we had a reviewer <laughs> we had a reviewer take it to a sport. He's flying it. He's loving it. He crashes it. He picks it up. He's like, it looks great. This thing is so durable. Holy cow! Which it is, right? Um, uh, once we fixed it, uh, and he goes up. He puts it on the ground. He takes off, and he's like, wow, it's still flying after this crazy crash. Uh, all of a sudden, the props turn off. It hits the ground. Explodes into a ball of flames, and he kicks it like a football, like a hundred feet away, and he catches it on video and sends it to us. Um, what are some of the FAA-like challenges you guys are facing? In this world, we've got, things seem to happen quicker when we've got big money backing them. And now we've got, uh, you know, Google, Bell Helicopters, uh, uh, you know, Boeing, Airbus, all the biggest names in aerospace are jumping into, there's, there's billions being spent behind closed doors on this kind of technology. 
with that kind of money, there's a lot of belief that this is going to happen and it has to change. And the FAA is listening and they're responding. In fact, the FAA reauthorization bill that happened last year is kind of a step towards segregating that airspace so that it will be usable for commercial airspace, uh, commercial purposes. And I think we'll find that uh, uh, in the near future, it'll become one of the most valuable assets that we have.